In the shadowy world of organized crime, the Gambino family stood out as one of the five criminal families established in New York City during the 1930s. At its peak, it rivaled the Genovese family in size, power, and wealth. The enigmatic and always cunning Carlo Gambino, with his prominent nose and somewhat sallow complexion, led this notorious criminal syndicate. Carlo Gambino, born on August 24, 1902, in Palermo, Italy, emerged as the future leader of one of America's most powerful and violent crime syndicates. Raised in a prosperous Sicilian family with deep mafia ties, Gambino admired the revered figures of the mafia in Palermo. These influential men commanded respect in the streets, where people would tip their hats and women would bow in reverence as they passed by. Leaving high school early, Gambino worked for Don Vito Castiofero, the mafia boss in Sicily, known for perfecting the art of extortion. Despite Gambino's seemingly non-criminal appearance, short stature, stocky build, and a prominent nose, he adhered to a creed that would propel him to the pinnacle of organized crime. One of his favorite mottos was, You must be like a lion and a fox. A fox is astute and recognizes traps. A lion is powerful and scares away wolves. If you're like a lion and a fox, no one can defeat you. Impressing Don Vito and his associates with his superior intelligence from a young age, Gambino was formally initiated into the Mafia at 19. However, with the rise of fascism in Italy in the 1920s, the Mafia faced increasing scrutiny and threats of eradication. Recognizing the potential danger, Gambino, leveraging his family ties and connections in America, emigrated to the New World in 1921. Upon arriving in America, Gambino, legally assisted by his family, quickly integrated into the bustling underworld of New York City. Welcomed with pomp by his cousins, the Castellans, who were already entrenched in criminal activities, Gambino was introduced to the organized crime scene. His arrival coincided with the Prohibition era, and the illegal trade of alcohol became the foundation of his success. In the 1920s, his cousins, the Castellans, were among the busiest bootleggers in New York. They utilized their small trucking business to transport illegal liquor. Gambino, entering the scene at the opportune moment, became an integral part of their operations, setting the stage for his ascent in the world of organized crime. Becoming a skillful transporter of liquor, armed with a shotgun, Carlo Gambino actively participated in truck hijackings from rival bootleggers. By 1927, he had aligned himself with one of New York's most powerful mobsters, Joe the Boss Masseria. This allegiance would plunge him into a four-year war for mafia supremacy in New York against Salvatore Maranzano, a formidable crime lord from a different section of Sicily. Masseria and Maranzano represented traditional mafia bosses adhering to old-world principles of honor, tradition, respect, and dignity. They were wary of working with non-Italians and non-Sicilians, maintaining a conservative approach to their criminal enterprises. As the rivalry escalated, Luciano, who worked for Masseria, saw an opportunity to switch sides. In a secret agreement with Maranzano, Luciano planned Masseria's murder in exchange for becoming the second-in-command. This plot materialized on April 15, 1931, when Masseria was assassinated in a restaurant on Coney Island. With Masseria out of the picture, Maranzano reorganized the Italian-American gangs in New York into five families led by Luciano, Profaci, Galliano, Mangano, and himself. However, Luciano's rise didn't sit well with his recently empowered ally, Charles Lucky Luciano. Just months after Masseria's murder, Luciano orchestrated Maranzano's assassination in 1931, marking the end of the Castellamari's War. Luciano then convened a meeting in Chicago, proposing the formation of a commission to govern organized crime and determine territories controlled by each family. The commission comprised seven bosses, including Luciano, Mangano, Garliano, Bonanno, Profaci, Al Capone of Chicago, and Stefano Magadino of Buffalo. At this point, Carlo Gambino and his cousins were soldiers for Vincent Mangano's family. Gambino proved himself an astute businessman and organizer, engaging in various criminal activities from usurious loans to illegal gambling and cargo theft. His knack for making money earned him a promotion to capo, overseeing his own crew. 
Following Italian mafia tradition, Gambino appointed his teenage cousin Paul Castellano as one of his crew members. In a move that strengthened his influence, Gambino married Catherine, Paul's sister, defying Catholic norms as they were cousins. This familial connection with the powerful Castellanos increased Gambino's sway. Settling into a modest house in Brooklyn with Catherine, Gambino raised three sons and a daughter. However, his marital and familial responsibilities did not curb his hunger for power and wealth. After the repeal of Prohibition in 1933, Gambino saw a new opportunity unfolding. Engaging in lucrative bootlegging, Carlo Gambino evaded taxes and undermined legitimate competitors, amassing his first fortune. Innovating criminal schemes, he orchestrated the theft of ration coupons during World War II, reaping profits on the black market. However, Gambino's extended stay in prison for tax evasion in 1937 interrupted his criminal endeavors, linking to a distillery in Philadelphia. By 1950, Gambino had risen as a powerful capo within the Mangano crime family, steadily enhancing his reputation. The mysterious disappearance of Vincent Mangano in 1951, presumed dead a decade later, left a power vacuum. Although Albert Anastasia was suspected of Mangano's murder, no arrests were made. Anastasia assumed control, renaming the family as the Anastasia crime family. The turning point for Carlo Gambino came in 1957 when Vito Genovese attempted to assassinate Frank Costello to reclaim leadership of the Luciano family. Up until then, three factions operated within the commission. Traditional bosses, Bonanno and Profaci, an apparently convenient alliance between Anastasia and Costello, and a closer association between Tommy Lucchese and Vito Genovese. Following Genovese's failed attempt on Costello's life, Vito Genovese, along with Gambino, conspired to eliminate Anastasia. This move aimed to propel Gambino to leadership. On October 27, 1957, while Anastasia visited a barbershop, gunmen ambushed and fatally shot him. Anastasia's death marked the end of an era, with only 12 attendees at his funeral, signifying his marginalized status within the Mafia. Albert Anastasia's demise heralded a new era of power struggles, betrayals, and the emergence of leaders like Carlo Gambino. The intricate web of alliances and conflicts within organized crime continued shaping its history in the years ahead. Now in charge, Gambino revitalized traditional mafia discipline and codes within the Anastasia family, later renamed the Gambino family. Under Gambino's leadership, the organization operated more discreetly, bringing a semblance of order to its activities. By 1958, at 56 years old, Carlo Gambino led New York's largest crime syndicate. The family controlled the bustling Brooklyn docks, but Gambino, driven by ambition, expanded illicit activities such as gambling. By 1958, at 56 years old, Carlo Gambino led New York's largest crime syndicate. The family controlled the bustling Brooklyn docks, but Gambino, driven by ambition, expanded illicit activities such as gambling. By fostering a more traditional and disciplined approach, Gambino transformed the former Anastasia family into the Gambino family, securing his position at the helm of New York's criminal underworld. Gambino's influence continued to grow as he extended the family's reach into various illegal enterprises. His calculated and strategic leadership style enabled him to navigate the complex world of organized crime, solidifying his role as a prominent figure in the Mafia. The intricate dynamics of alliances and rivalries within the criminal underworld would further shape the trajectory of Carlo Gambino's legacy. Involved in a diverse array of criminal activities, Carlo Gambino expanded beyond traditional Mafia enterprises, venturing into construction, usurious loans, and even white-collar crimes such as securities fraud on Wall Street. Rumors circulated that Gambino and Charles Lucky Luciano assisted in financing a Puerto Rican drug trafficker to falsely implicate Vito Genovese in a narcotics business. Their alleged success led to Genovese's 1959 conviction, sentencing him to 15 years in the federal penitentiary in Atlanta, where he eventually died in 1969. With Genovese incarcerated, Carlo Gambino's influence within the Mafia Commission grew significantly. Despite his wealth and power, Gambino maintained a modest lifestyle, avoiding attention. 
In contrast to figures like Albert Anastasia, known for their ruthless and openly violent acts, Gambino operated more as a business-savvy gangster, keeping a low profile. His elusive nature, coupled with strategic intelligence, became the source of his immense power. Although Gambino refrained from ostentatious displays, he did indulge in one luxury, an inconspicuous dark-colored car with his initials on the license plate. This subtle display of influence underscored his ability to balance power discreetly. By the mid-1960s, approaching his 60s, Gambino appeared more like a kind grandfather than a feared mob boss. Witnesses recalled encounters with him as surprisingly friendly, contrasting sharply with the common perception of a ruthless crime lord. In the late 1960s, as his crime family expanded, Gambino solidified his status as one of the most powerful figures in New York. His remarkable ascent, achieved without becoming a U.S. citizen or completing high school in Italy, culminated in an empire worth millions. The conglomerate of businesses he controlled required a level of intelligence that distinguished him even within the Mafia. Gambino's respect extended beyond the criminal world. During rare outings, he attended a Frank Sinatra performance at the Westchester premiere. While Sinatra may have been the star, Gambino received royal treatment. Sinatra invited him and his group to the dressing room between shows, delaying the second performance at Gambino's leisure. This level of respect mirrored Gambino's commitment to both his criminal family and his biological family. Devotion to his family paralleled Gambino's dedication to the Mafia. His wife, Catherine, played the role of the perfect Mafia wife, discreetly supporting her husband without delving too deeply into his business. Catherine's warmth endeared her even to the toughest mobsters who visited their home. However, federal authorities, suspecting Gambino's involvement in organized crime, maintained constant surveillance on his seemingly respectable household throughout the 1970s. In the early 1970s, another Mafia boss, Joseph Colombo, rose to prominence, creating the Italian-American Civil Rights League. However, not everyone was fooled by appearances. Federal agents continued their watchful eye on Gambino's activities, hoping to link him to organized crime. As the intricate web of alliances, rivalries, and power struggles unfolded, Carlo Gambino's legacy continued to evolve, leaving an indelible mark on the history of the American Mafia. Carlo Gambino, the formidable head of the Gambino crime family, rose to power through cunning and strategic alliances. His influence extended over various criminal enterprises, from loan sharking to white-collar crimes like Wall Street fraud. Notoriously discreet, Gambino avoided the flashy lifestyle of some mob bosses, opting for a low-key existence despite his immense wealth. Gambino's ascent to power faced challenges, including attempts to frame Vito Genovese, a rival for drug-related charges. Successfully orchestrating Genovese's imprisonment, Gambino solidified his standing within the Mafia's commission. Despite his criminal pursuits, Gambino maintained an image of an affable elder, often interacting with locals and attending events like Frank Sinatra's performances. His wife, Catherine, contributed to this facade, portraying the perfect mob wife while enduring constant surveillance by federal authorities. In 1971, Gambino found himself entangled in a plot involving Joseph Colombo, who sought to combat anti-Italian prejudices. A shooting occurred at one of Colombo's events, leaving Colombo paralyzed. While the blame fell on a shooter, speculation arose about Gambino's involvement in orchestrating the incident. Amidst legal challenges, including deportation threats, Gambino's health declined. He orchestrated deals with influential congressmen to avert deportation, showcasing his ability to navigate both legal and underworld landscapes. However, Gambino's weakened heart eventually succumbed to a heart attack in 1976, marking the end of his era. Paul Castellano, Gambino's chosen successor, inherited a disciplined and prosperous crime family. Castellano's leadership focused on white-collar crimes, solidifying the family's influence in legitimate businesses. The Gambino family's discreet operations, often centered on illegal gambling and union control, contributed to their vast wealth. As Castellano took the reins, the secretive code of silence, or omerta, continued to define the Mafia. Members adhered to this code, ensuring that the organization's inner workings remained hidden from law enforcement. 
Carlo Gambino's legacy endured, shaping the Gambino crime family's trajectory for years to come.